This dossier contains a gripping, suspenseful story filled with unexpected events and tangled webs. A man, betrayed and determined for revenge, sets out to wreak havoc on the life of a woman. Join me as we delve into this tale to uncover secrets, dark plans, and surprising twists. Don't forget to subscribe to the AB Top channel to never miss out on such fascinating stories. I tricked my soon-to-be ex-wife into believing that I had an affair. Then, on Christmas Day, Thermonuclear Shinobi served her and vanished. This will be a very long post because it covers events from late 2019 until last week, so I hope you have some time and a food. All names are changed here in accordance with the guidelines. Alright, so here is the history. My sweetie from high school is my soon-to-be ex-wife, Sue. When we were both 17 in 1992, we began dating. Since then, the 45-year-old and I have been together. I've only ever dated her once in my entire life. At 22, we tied the knot five years after graduating from college. After a year, we welcomed our first of two boys, now ages 17 and 22, into our family. I gave her 23 years, built her a house, and put in a ton of overtime to make sure she had the life she desired. True, there were difficult times in our marriage, but who doesn't? We managed to survive and move on from even the most trying circumstances, so it was all the more shocking when we learned of her affair. Rewind to March 2020, the month I first sensed something wasn't quite right. A good two months before, we were not feeling well. I was still limited in my movement even though I was recovering from reconstructive knee surgery after blowing out my ACL in the autumn of 2019. I could only move my knee about 55% of its normal range at the moment. This affected a number of things in the house. I was unable to perform my regular household tasks due to an injury I sustained at work, therefore I was on workers' compensation. Therefore, a lot was backed up. Although my sons would try their best, there were things that only I could accomplish, therefore they had to be put on the back burner or completed by my wife, who wasn't happy about it. In the bedroom, too, things came to a halt between us. Before my injury, it had already started to slow down, but in my condition at the moment, it came to a total stop. Sue was spending more time after work socializing with co-workers during these months. From November 2019 to March 2020, she experienced it frequently. I didn't give it any thought, of course. In the 23 years that I've known her, I've never had any cause for concern or mistrust. We have mutual friends, she has her pals and I have mine. There were never any problems when I went out and spent time with my pals. Everything was done legally. I became aware of something strange in January of this year. Sue began to act very aloof towards me. Yes, we were in a bad place, but she would never have denied me love up to that moment. She stopped giving me the regular hugs and kisses. Long before my suspicions started to surface, she always had her phone tucked into her hand and she would show me and share things she found online, including memes, Pinterest recipes, and do-it-yourself projects. Now, though, she was being circumspect about her phone. She even started acting snippy around me, as if she didn't want to be bothered. So, March has here. Now that COVID-19 has reached New York City, it is under lockdown. Since our chosen professions qualify as important, none of us needs to work from home. I had spent the last five months on the sidelines recovering my knee, so I was excited to get back to work when I was finally cleared. To set the scene, I like to be active. I practice martial arts extensively, and aside from all the chores I completed at home, I usually visit the gym four days a week. After the lockup, my soon-to-be ex-wife tells me that she will need to resume working longer hours again after a week or two. This doesn't bother me because of her field. Naturally, I thought it would be every other day, but it was actually every day, not just for an hour or two. After arriving home three or more hours later, she would immediately take a shower, hang out with our 17-year-old, who lives with his girlfriend across town, and then retire to bed. We resumed our intimate relationship once more as I was able to better support myself on my knee. But I quickly realized, as you would certainly expect, that she wasn't emotionally or mentally there for it. Thus, at the beginning of April, 
I could see the picture becoming clearer. It was clear from all the signals that she was having an affair. I made the decision to look for solutions at that point. I thus searched the internet for indicators of infidelity in a partner, things I should be on the lookout for. She was, in fact, fulfilling every need for this kind of behavior. My search query then progressed to how do I find proof? I looked at her Facebook posts from months ago to start with her social media. The photos are mostly of us with our sons, her and her friends, and numerous occasions when she goes out with coworkers. These photos feature a diverse group of her closest coworkers as well as a few people I've never met. However, I notice that there is a single male in several of these pictures. He's way too close for a guy I've never met in any photo, with his arm around her shoulder or his hand on her lower back in every one of them. It goes without saying that that left a bad taste in my mouth. That was hardly the worst of it, though. No, 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 the worst part was that it seems like this guy follows her on Instagram and is a Facebook friend of hers. I go to search for his Facebook account, and to my surprise, I've been blocked. He's friends with her on Facebook, why the hell am I not allowed to view his account? Yes, I'm like, Batman detective mode right now. I wasn't even trying to refute it at that point. She was cheating on me with this guy, and I knew it. My goal was to determine the duration, and I accomplished that over the months of April and May. You know, until then, I had no idea how much information could be obtained from text, phone, and email records. Thanks to our family plan cell phone bundle, I was able to retrieve a significant amount of data. The data history of my soon-to-be ex-wife was instructive. Between October 2019 and April 2020, she had contacted two numbers the most, mine and one other. I had never before seen. Speculate as to whose number it was. I verified that the guy in the pictures was the one who had blocked me on Facebook with a fast search on Google. He will be referred to as P as that is who he is. Once more, the picture gets further clearer at this time, however she was deleting a lot of their inconsistent texts and messages. Nothing in the data could be a dead giveaway that proved she was cheating on me with this guy, even though I knew it. I required additional proof. At this point, I share what I've discovered with my closest friend. When he asked if I had shown her what I had, I told him no since I didn't think it was enough. At that point, he informed me about an app one could download that purportedly allowed me to watch her conversations in real time. Since I'm not familiar with the guidelines here, I won't provide the name. After installing it, I synchronized my data plan and bided my time. After a few days, I eventually saw it, a text exchange between the two of them discussing how much fun they had the night before and deciding to repeat it the following weekend. Whoa! I was upset to put it mildly, after getting punched. That must be considered my D-Day because I was completely shattered for the next two days. She realized that the two days following D-Day were deliberately spent apart from her. She would make an effort to comfort me and inquire as to what was wrong, but I would ignore her and move on. I was in shock to see that this woman, to whom I had devoted 23 years of my life and all of my husbandly resources, had left our marriage for a man who was only five years older than our oldest son. By the third day, I was angry instead of depressed. When I called Oz to confirm my suspicion, he inquired if I had already challenged her. I told him I wanted retribution and gave a no. I wanted to ruin her, not just get a divorce. I wanted to effing wreck her and leave her life in ruins. Since doing so would take time, I came up with a strategy. My approach was going to be based on a quotation I had come across while reading and researching adultery. It went something like this, the enemy of infidelity is unpredictability. I was going to turn her life into a living hell while surreptitiously organizing my escape route. It's early June already, and the app is still installed on my device. I'm collecting as much information as I can from their back and forth messages almost every night. They are conversing as though they are in a committed relationship, talking about nudity, lovebirds, and sexting. I was merely gathering information and cataloging everything on my secret FPS server at that time, and I had stopped looking at any of it. In the meantime, I start acting strangely. I start leaving at strange hours and returning home later than she does. 
I use my phone a lot more than normal when she's around. I just answer, just stuff, and put my phone away when she asks me, what are you up to? Also, I had altered all of my login credentials to prevent her from accessing any of my files. We had never kept anything from one another during our whole marriage, but at some point, I believe it was the beginning of her affair, she changed the passwords on both her phone and Facebook, saying it was necessary due to security lapses in the previous few months. Yes, that's a pretty good pretext for keeping your affair from your husband. I told my only sister, my older sister, and two more of my closest friends about my plan, and I also let us in on it. I sworn them to secrecy and trusted these individuals with my life. To put things in perspective, Joey and Na are buddies that we've known since high school, while Oz and I have been pals since we were young. Na is important to remember because she will be involved later on. When July arrives, M, her soon-to-be ex, is in full paranoid mode. These days, she's messaging and calling much more regularly, asking me questions like when I'm coming home while she is, if I'll be home when she comes home, and what I'm up to. I can see that the seed that was sown in her mind a month ago is beginning to grow, particularly in the way she speaks with P. She's telling him that I'm becoming aloof and cold, and she's confiding in him about her uncertainty and bewilderment. This woman's nerve. She confirms that, yes, she has experienced this in my home and proposes that perhaps they should cease meeting at our house in the interim of these exchanges with P. Regards, Sue. P genuinely irritated her when he asked her in that particular contact whether she was concerned that I might be cheating on her. The amount of happiness and laughter I experienced upon reading that exchange, my cheating wife debating with her affair partner over whether or not she is upset that her husband might be having an extramarital affair, is beyond words. What a ridiculous irony. Remember that when I go, I won't be hooking up with anyone. I'm generally going out with my brothers, watching fights, drinking a lot of alcohol, and hanging out at Oz or Joey's, or at my big sister's place with my Bill, who is like an elder brother to me. While her husband is 58, my sister is 52. She had informed him about my STBXW adultery, but not my strategy, I couldn't take the chance because he tends to be a blabbermouth. Now fast forward to October, when things really start to ramp up. After three months of my fake relationship, Sue is acutely aware that I'm purposefully separating from her. I hadn't even touched her until October 20, 2020, the day she faced me, the day I carried out my plan. No embraces, no kisses, no flirting, none of it. She was still with Foss, just in his apartment or at hotels, so it's not like she needed it. She calls me at work that afternoon, which wasn't unusual before all of this started but it hadn't happened in a long time. She says she has to tell me something important, so she wants me to come home right away after work. I won't lie to you guys, naturally, she didn't come clean about her infidelity, but I kind of thought she would. Instead, when I go home, she has the audacity to ask me if I'm not satisfied with her. She points out that I've been gone from home too much, that I no longer show her love, and that our intimate relationship has completely ended. She says she's concerned that I'm turning away from her since I felt resentful of the way she handled me while I was recovering from a knee injury. Then the punchline hit, if I was cheating on her, she gasped. People, I burst out laughing uncontrollably on the ground. And by hysterically I mean like the Joker, gasping with laughter. It appeared to her, if she was right, that I was laughing off the idea of being unfaithful, but in reality, it was just me laughing at how ridiculous what I was seeing was. It takes me over two minutes of crying and beating on the ground in full-blown sobs before I can gather myself enough to respond. I shake my head, sit up, and look her in the eyes for the first time in months, but I don't respond. I get up, tidy up, give her a quick kiss on the top of the head, and proceed to my sleeping quarters. Later that evening, at my office, I decide that, considering how briefly everything had happened, I should examine what she was telling him. I open the app, and sure enough, they are messaging back and forth in real time. I asked him tonight, and he literally laughed in my face. He fell on the floor and laughed for like five minutes, she says P, implying that he is cheating on her, though it wasn't five minutes, clearly. He doesn't even care how I feel anymore. I don't know how or why, but he's gone. I know I've lost him.
This is karma, I know it. The Cheshire cat must have been pleased with the look on my face as I read that. She was crumbling. P made an effort to comfort her, telling her that she wouldn't have needed to turn to him for what I wasn't providing for her if I truly cared about her. However, I could tell by the tone of her comments that she was unsure. Now that I was unable to perform my duties as a husband because of a valid disability, she had the audacity to leave our marriage and continued the affair for about a full year at that point. However, the notion of losing me to another woman was sufficient to cause her to falter. What a fucking coward. While doing all of this, I was also carrying out the second element of my payback plan, which involved organizing my finances. I had visited with a family lawyer in September to begin the process of filing for divorce, bringing with me a ton of material that I had accumulated up until then. As far as divorce goes, New York is an at-fault state, and the mountain of evidence I'd acquired showing Sue's adultery pretty much proved I could pin her to the effing wall in a divorce. In order to prepare for any potential asset division that may arise, my lawyer advised me to organize all of my finances. I even went one step further and transferred all of my funds from our joint account into my personal one in secret. Phase 2 also included my beginning my flat search. Now that November has here, I have not altered my behavior, instead, I have become more aggressive. This is when Nina, my friend, comes in handy. To put things in perspective, Nah and Sue have never been close. Sue and Nina were the first people I met in our first year of high school. Sue has always viewed Na as a threat because she is the closest female friend of mine. With Na, Sue has always seemed to be implying that I don't trust her. Although she has never said so outright, it's clear to anyone who listens. On the other hand, Nina has never really liked Sue. When Sue and I first started dating, Nina pointed out to me that Sue was essentially forcing herself into our little circle of friends, whereas I didn't do the same with Sue's group of friends. Na found that annoying since she understood Sue's motivation. As of right now, Na is the only girl in my square and P is the only male friend in Sue's circle. Na eventually made it back to New York City on November 3rd after being forced to stay abroad due to the virus. Joey, Oz, and I agreed to spend a night at Joey's house having dinner and drinks to celebrate her return. There were just the five of us, me, Oz, Joey, and Joey's wife, Anne who is also Nina's sister. Following CDC recommendations, we treat the Rona carefully. Nah, she comes up with a devious plan to set Sue off since she's a wicked mastermind. She recommended that we shoot some similar pictures to the ones I found of Sue and P months earlier and upload them to my Facebook page, so that's exactly what we did. Sue didn't find out until the 5th, I suppose because some friends saw my updates and realized how uncomfortable I was getting near to Nah. She still thought I was cheating, and I'm quite sure she wanted to blame Na, but this greatly confused her because she knew Na had spent most of the year in Europe. Nevertheless, it didn't stop her from trying to dress me down that evening since, in her words, I seemed too handsy in the pictures. I saw this as a perfect chance to land my knockout blow with the lead jab. I respond, so what about the pics with you and Paws from last year? He was pretty handsy in them but did you see me get bent out of shape over it? Deer in the headlights. It was an initial instance. I use Facebook, when I actually do post something, it's like an event to people, which is why the pictures with Nina-specific content gained so much traction among our circles. I even mentioned the dude's name throughout all of this. The hamster wheel in her head started reeling in real time as she tried to explain away those pics. That's little. I can see how it looks, but there's nothing there. I'm sorry if those pictures hurt you. I'll delete them. No, no, the pictures aren't what hurt me. What hurt me was that you lied to me about working extra hours and hanging out with friends while you were seeing another man. And explain away she did. He's that way with everyone. He's just a really friendly guy. But revenge is best served cold, as Lieutenant C. Worf from Star Trek. TNG so eloquently put it. Ever since that night, Sue has been extremely clinging and attentive to me, to the point of annoyance, she tried to pursue intimacy and affection with me, but I would always push her away. Meanwhile, I'm still recording everything she says to P. By this point, 
I'd become numb, any desire I may have had to salvage my marriage was gone, and I checked out on the day I carried out the first part of my plan. Then she drops a bombshell, she says she can't see him anymore, that the guilt is too much for her, that she feels like karma is suffocating her, that she can't risk losing me, that she loves P very much but that she's still in love with me, and that she has to save her marriage before she loses me. No, my dear, you're about eight months too late for that. She's confiding in him about how bad things have gotten for her, that she doesn't know what to do, and that all she feels like I hate her. That text chain would be the last one they'd have until about three weeks ago. During the rest of November and early December, Sue is in a state of confusion, trying to figure out where my head is and still not being able to tell if I'm actually being unfaithful. Meanwhile, P is steadily blowing up her phone every day, but she's not responding to him. I'd see her check her phone often but quickly put it away. P.A. loses his cool, saying lovely things like he doesn't love you the way I love you, and... In the meantime, step two of the plan was now formally finished. I'd completed the divorce papers, located a studio apartment in Co-op City, a neighborhood familiar to New Yorkers, signed a two-year lease, transferred all of my funds into my personal account, and was prepared to throw caution to the wind. So... Thanksgiving is coming up, and my oldest and his girlfriend, as well as my oldest girlfriend's parents, she's an only child, Sue, me, and our youngest, were all hosting a small get-together for our immediate families. It was a great night, and my oldest girlfriend, who was pursuing her culinary studies, handled all of the cooking herself. Let me tell you, this girl can cook. I kissed her on the cheek, gave her a few cute little hugs, and wrapped my arms around her shoulders from behind all of which I initiated because I had to maintain the impression that everything was fine between Sue and me. She appreciated the gestures, too. Keep in mind that this was the first time I had ever touched her since the night she confronted me in October, so that's only about two months ago. I'll admit that I felt disgusted, but I had no choice. I couldn't risk the plan and me being distant from her in front of my boys, my oldest girlfriend, and her parents. My youngest then decides he wants to spend the night with his big brother. Sue and I then head home, and during the drive home, she tells me how much I've loved her and that I don't know what she's going through, but I'm here for her. I had to control my laughter to keep from exploding again and reply, I know, I just need time. So, for the first time realistically since springtime, we head into my hat night. I figured, with what I'm about to do, may as well get some action before I delete her from my existence. I won't go into detail, but it wasn't love. When I was finished, she was a lump of flesh laying there trying to figure out the direction of the truck that ran her over. No cuddling or anything after. I just got up, showered, and went to go sleep in my office. To her confusion, though, I used a condom. First time in two damn decades I did. She was definitely perplexed by it, but she didn't ask questions. Sure as hell wasn't going raw on her, knowing that she'd been doing so with P for months at that point. The following morning, I check my handy-dandy spy app and see that, for the first time in weeks, she's responded to P, dude went full Nella, declaring his love for her and telling her that she was wasting her time trying to rekindle a flame that had died that she'd been in a prison with me for 23 years and that she deserved to experience the love and affection of a man who would cherish her. Keep in mind that this dude is five years older than our oldest son, and that he's sprung on a 45-year-old. For this dude, pretty boy with a soft side. Ha! Huh. She responded saying pretty much the same thing she said when last they talked, that she loves him and enjoyed their time together but can't lose me. I'm still the love of her life but she'll always have a place for him in her heart. They can still be friends if he chooses, but the physical relationship between them is over. He begged her to see him one last time that week, and yep, you guessed it, she said yes. One more for the road, right? Who am I to say anything? That's what I did to her the previous night. Of course, I added all of that to the archive I'd compiled on December 4th, Phase 3. The final phase of Operation Shinobi Ghost started. The divorce papers were in hand, my new place of residence was set up, and now I had to slowly start moving my stuff out of the house. But first, I had to break the news to my boys. I called my oldest to the house that Friday night, had them join me in my office, and laid everything on the table. 
not the specifics, but that their mother had been cheating on me for over a year and I was going to be filing for divorce soon. My 17-year-old was especially shaken up by this because he himself had recently experienced his first taste of infidelity. Yep, his first girlfriend had cheated on him just four months prior. Seeing his heartbroken a second time at the idea that his own mother was capable of doing this hit him hard. My oldest took it a lot better and suggested taking his brother in to live with him until this blows over, to which I agreed. We packed up some of his stuff, and he asked me, was I going to be okay? Yes, son, you and I are going to be fine, I reassured him. We're going to be okay, I swear. And then they left. The hardest part was over, and it was time to arm the nukes. Over the next few weeks, day by day, Oz would assist me in getting a little of my most sensitive stuff out of the house. I gave him a list of all the definite items to grab while Sue and I were at work, and I left him the spare key. This was all stuff Sue wouldn't notice was missing unless you told her. I also got a new phone and phone number and informed everyone who needed to know, Oz, Joey, Nah, my boys, big sister, and my mother. In the meantime, I continued the ruse with Sue, and she wasn't the wiser, trickling little bits of affection to her just to keep her off the trail. While she's still in contact with PA, not to the extent that they've been P. I began creating printouts, people, and I must have spent over $1,500 on staple supplies, printer ink, paper, binders, the works. I cataloged everything in order from the start of the affair until that last bit two weeks ago on December 16th. I've archived everything since I started the plan, call logs, texts, pics, emails, and everything. I took the 14 binders, put them in a box, wrapped each one, and addressed it to different people, her parents, her brother, her mother, my father, who passed away seven years ago, her parents, her two sisters, and her HR department. Did I mention that P works for the same company, and because of the nature of her work, there is an express rule against intercompany relationships? A few of her friends, POS, and P's parents hauled all of those to the post office and shipped them out on December 16th, with an ETA for delivery on December 22nd to 24th, perfect. Now that it's Christmas Eve, Sue returns home at her usual time, I had stopped following her on the app on the 18th, figuring I'd gotten as much mileage as possible from it. She showers, hangs out with me for a while, and I blow her back out on the living room couch, I know, I'm a, explicit, before she goes to bed. Finally, the final was here, the nuclear bomb I had been preparing since June was going to go off. I woke up in the middle of the night, packed up the things I really needed, enough to fill two backpacks, and left my house of 23 years, one week ago. T. Sue. I wrapped up one of the three binders that still had the divorce papers taped to the inside cover and placed it on my side of the bed with a Merry Christmas note on it. Next to it, I left my old phone and my lawyer's business card. I am off the grid, completely gone, shadow ghosted. She's blocked me on Facebook, but for some reason she hasn't blocked me, so I'm monitoring the fallout. It's amazing. My packages have made it to everyone I sent them to, and Sue is being crucified. Her youngest sister has completely disgraced her, both of her parents have condemned her. My mother has destroyed her completely, like, holy, explicit. I know my mother is mean, but the things she called Sue are UNF holy. She's been frantically searching for anyone who knows where I am, but those who don't know are silent. She's reaching out to me all over her Facebook feed, which is probably a sign that she knows I'm probably looking, but I'm not going to say anything, explicit, to her without my lawyer there. That'll be the next time I breathe the same air as her. She can't spin the story to make me look bad because I've exposed her to everyone who matters to her, and based on what a mutual friend who works for the same company as her told me, she and POS appear to be placed on administrative leave starting tomorrow, so yay, chances are she'll be jobless come 2021. Do I feel guilty about this? Not in the slightest. I did the right thing by this woman for 23 years, I gave her the home and family she desired, the life I felt we both deserved, and unconditional love. I never wavered, never strayed, and I never even entertained the thought of breaking my vows. As for the last two binders, 
Well, one has been given to my lawyer as my last piece of evidence for my impending divorce, and the last one I put in my storage unit to be burned in Joey's fire pit when the divorce is final. I have no sympathy for what I did or for her, she can burn in hell for all I care about. The most I stand to lose is my house, my car, and maybe a couple hundred bucks a month in alimony. However, since the divorce is filed under the statute of adultery in NYS, it's at fault, and that might get waived with the overwhelming amount of evidence I've provided. As far as I'm concerned, she's dead to me, and I'm never looking back. I'm going to meet with the soon-to-be ex-wife's lawyer tomorrow, so I guess I'll just update here. Quick edit, NYS is not entirely at fault, under certain circumstances, a divorce can be filed at fault of which my lawyer has informed me my case falls under. Update. I tricked my soon-to-be ex-wife into thinking I was cheating, then thermonuclear shinobi ghosted and served her on Christmas Day. Christmas Day was my first full day in my new flat, which is still a work in progress since I want to buy more stuff, but overall, I've made it my home since I'll be here for two years at least. My boys and the eldest GF came over and spent a good part of the day with me, the GF brought over treats she'd made and also whipped up a really nice meal. It was nice to sit and talk with my sons in a way that I hadn't done in a long time. Additionally, my big sister came over with more goodies and the next significant event occurred last week on December 29, 2020, at around noon. I received a text from Nina inquiring if I was free that evening. Since I wasn't, we arranged to meet up after work. She arrives and we head to a diner nearby where I work in NYC. Thanks to the Rona, we're doing indoor dining at 25% capacity, but there's generally no problem finding a seat because so many of us choose not to eat out as much these days. Whatever the case, once we're seated and order our food, now pretty much lays all of her cards on the table. To be honest, I knew this was coming, she basically confessed that she's like me, going all the way back to when we were teenagers, but Sue swooped in and got me before she could. To put things in perspective, I've known Na for two years longer than Sue, and as I mentioned, she's been the fourth point of my social square of myself, Oz, and Joey. In high school, we were the social outcasts, the raver kids who didn't fit into any of the other cliques, Na had a weight problem and was diabetic, she was the heavy-set goth chick who was super cool but no guy would ever give a second glance to. But we've always had chemistry. Na is a personal trainer and yoga instructor these days, she was the ugly duckling who turned into one hell of a beautiful swan, if I must say. Long story short, we decided that we would start seeing each other upon the completion of my divorce, and yay, I slept with her that night. I took her back to my new pad, and we had a grand old time. Am I ashamed of sleeping with her? Hell no. Nina's been a better friend to me than Sue ever was. That's not to say Sue wasn't my best friend, but over the nearly 25 years that I've known Na, she's always supported me, even to the extent that I discovered that day. That kind of resonated with me in a way I didn't think it would. I'm simply trying to convince myself that sleeping with her was the right choice. I really do believe that it was, and I intend to fully commit to exploring our future together. Now that we've had two weeks since I ghosted my STBXW, let's talk about yesterday, the day I met with my wife and her attorney to discuss the terms of the divorce. This past Monday, I received a call from my stalker informing me that Sue's attorney had set up a meeting for us to discuss the terms of the divorce on January 6, 2021, which was yesterday. I met with him on Tuesday morning to go over the details. Long story short, I want an uncontested divorce from Sue on the grounds of marital neglect. I want to give her my entire estate, sell her my half of the house ownership, keep our cars, and give her my cabin in the Poconos. I also want to deny her any spousal support while we're claiming marital neglect. As for 17, my son, going forward, he can live with whoever he wants after the divorce, which will probably be me. So, on Wednesday, I show up at my lawyer's office wearing my best Johnny Cash outfit. My wife and her attorney look like they're barely hanging on, so I give them the silent treatment. I won't bore you with the legalese, but her attorney made an offer for terms of reconciliation, which I rejected almost as soon as she finished outlining the request. As I mentioned earlier, I won't bore you with the details of the meeting. In the end, 
we decided on a legal separation that would result in an uncontested divorce, with the only modification being that I would pay her $653 a month in temporary spousal support until she finds gainful employment once more. Yes, she was fired for Fingo's, and he was fired for it too. Up to a year after the finalization. She's on her own after a full year has gone by from the divorce's finalization date. It's a small price to pay to be rid of her cheating ass. The process will take around three months, so if all goes according to plan, I should be able to get rid of her by early April. After the meeting, my lawyer says a few more words and says he will contact me to let me know how the filing is going. Later, when I'm walking down the street, Sue comes up to me and asks, Can we talk? She held it together rather well throughout the meeting, but outside, let the waterworks run, so I felt I'd give her at least that. She asked, could I ever find it in my heart to forgive her and that maybe in a few years could we try to start over, that she can't imagine what her life is going to be without me? Acknowledging her mistakes and saying that she never intended it to go as far as it did, she said she never expected to fall in love with P.A. but knew when she thought I was cheating how wrong it was to betray her own husband in such a way, this will be the last time I speak to her or see her, so I advise her to start seeing it soon. I tell her that 17 is almost a man, that he should be able to make his own decisions about his own future, that I gave her half of my life and all of my unconditional love, and that she, in her own words, fell in love with another man, that there is no way in hell that I will ever be able to forgive her, that all of my love for her was slowly smothered all those months that she professed her love to P rather than coming to me to tell me that she was having problems with our relationship. Here we are on the sidewalk in midtown Manhattan, her making a scene crying her eyes out. A few people passed by and gave her side glances, but at that point, I didn't care. I wasn't about to publicly humiliate her, I'd pretty much already socially and professionally destroyed her, but I needed to let out the last bit of emotion I had left for her. I told her I loved who she once was but I hate who stands before me, and if I never see her again, it will be too soon. I concluded by telling her that, while I regretted not having regretted our 23 years of marriage, I was sorry that, in those 23 years, she had chosen to take the easy route and that, I have your lovely sons on Reddit to thank for this last one, had suddenly occurred to me seconds before I said it. In those 23 years, I had thought she was mine, but in the end, it was just my turn. I put in my rakins, turned around, and left. Her father apologizes to me over the phone later that night, and while I can't imagine myself keeping a relationship with anyone on her side of the family after that call, I will admit that I will miss the old man. My dad passed away years ago, so he has always been my fallback father figure. He tells me he's ashamed of her and that I raised her better than what she did. I went on FB and symbolically changed my relationship status to divorced. Yay, it's not final yet but in my eyes, it's over and done. Like I said, when I make a post on FB, it's an event, so plenty of folks started hitting me up over messenger asking questions, and I laid it all out that I filed for divorce with Sue earlier in the day. Of course, Nina called me shocked that I pulled the trigger so fast. Obviously, I was already in the process of it when we spoke, but she had no way of knowing how far it was along. I asked her if she could come over, and of course, she comes running. We knocked boots again, but this time she stayed the night. We laid in my bed and talked into the wee hours of the morning, and I haven't felt this level of relief and connection in a really long time. Now gets me, and I can't get enough being around her. Since the day she confided in me, she's all that's been on my mind. Yeah, I know some folks are going to say it's up, I'm moving on so fast but as far as I'm concerned, my marriage ended the day P let Sue touches Pecker, so yay, that's it, that's the end. My divorce is in the works, and I'm moving on to start a relationship with Na. We're going to take it slow, and we're not announcing anything until the divorce with Sue is official and legal. I know that I mentioned in a comment response to someone that I'd probably never marry again, but that was before Na came clean to me about how she felt towards me, and I can't deny that I feel the same. Regarding Sue, I could care less about what happens to her, she could move P into our old home. I will receive my money for the house in four quarterly installments over the course of 2021. Other than the $653 I will deposit directly into her savings account each month, 
I will never have to see or speak with her again. I am eternally grateful to everyone who has offered support, encouragement, and appreciation. Update, soon-to-be ex-wife of 23 years just tried to end her life last night. The hits just keep on coming. I've been sitting in this for hours now, didn't know where to post this, so this sub seemed appropriate. If you want a bit of backstory, check my post history for the details. I'm not keen on how linking to other subs here works, but my previous two entries are viewable in my profile. The quick version is this. I discovered my wife of 23 years, 45F, was having an affair with a 27-year-old. I continued the live for more than four and a half months while gathering evidence of her adultery, obtaining divorce papers, and organizing my exit strategy, which included gradually moving my personal belongings from our house to a new flat, getting a new phone and number, transferring half of our income from our joint account to me, and so on. On December 16, 2020, I collected all of the evidence of her affair, compiled and printed it from beginning to end, filed it all into 14 by. Her life completely imploded, her family pretty much excommunicated her, her friends, the ones who didn't know about the affair, ostracized her, and my own mother took her to task, calling her the most scathing and vile things you could possibly think of. On Christmas Eve, while she slept, I took one of the three binders that remained and did the same. Only this one, I taped the divorce notice to the inside cover and left it on my side of the bed which, mind you, she had her L on several occasions. She and her lover were also put on administrative leave and ultimately fired. We had our divorce hearing last week and agreed to an uncontested legal separation and divorce with some transitional provisions since she is no longer working. I will pay $653 per month for utilities until the date of the divorce finalization which is anticipated to be in three months. She will keep the house, her car, and half of the shared assets, while I will keep my half of the assets, my vehicles, car, motorcycle. Which gets us to last night, following the hearing, we had a farewell conversation in which she attempted to defend her adultery and asked me to give her another chance once the divorce was finalized. I politely declined, spoke her some harsh things, and ended our relationship. I've blocked my soon-to-be ex-wife from all social media platforms, so the only people who know my new contact information are my mother, two sons, and closest friends. However, there are still some friends that we have in common. Last night, while I'm hanging around my flat, I receive a voice call notification on Messenger from one of those friends, one of the few who hadn't dumped her after I found out about her affair. She didn't waste any time in telling me that she had gone to check O. Her parents and two of her sisters were also present at the hospital, I assume they were notified after the hospital attempted to notify me, but Sue still had my old hash as her emergency contact. I simply told her friend no, Sue is not my problem anymore, and she clearly decided she wanted to take the easy way out rather than deal with the shame and agony of the 23-year marriage she blew up. She is in the ICU and in critical but stable condition, the doctor said that she will likely pull through. I told her friend that Sue's family could help her sort things out, but that as far as Sue and I are concerned, there is no Sue and I anymore, and I ended the call. I've had a few hours to think about it, and this morning my sons called to ask if I knew. I told them that I did, but I also let them know that I will not hold it against them or judge them for it because, well, Sue is their mother, but I myself wash my hands of her and don't give a damn about what she does to herself or for herself. I'm getting dogpiled on to go see her but I don't feel anything for this woman anymore. I haven't felt anything for her in a long time. I checked out during the process of getting my payback for her betrayal, and I stand by the fact that I don't care at all for what she's done. In fact, it makes me hate her even more. She's the one who was unfaithful. She's the one who thought a nefarious thing was right. They were both a little taken aback by this, but they respected my stance. However, now that the news about her suicide attempt has spread, many of the friends who dropped her are starting to surface again and saying I need to be there for her. She picks the most self-serving course of action when faced with the consequences of her decisions. Even now, when it's highly likely that she will survive, she's fostered instant empathy from everyone who has criticized her and most of her family, save her father who has reached out to me in the last few hours and expressed his respect for my decision to remain away, 
are painting me as the jaded ex-husband who is unwilling to feel sorry for her. It's as though I never really knew this woman for 23 years, and it comes down to this. Yes, I understand that the way I ended our relationship may have contributed to her mental instability, but now that she's the victim of an extremely risky and calculated move to win back the people who, only weeks earlier, had denounced her for betraying me, she's not the good guy anymore, a whole new can of worms has been opened. I apologize if this sounds ranty, but I'm here trying to make sense of this. I want to be clear. I'm not going to visit Sue because, although I've been cool, calm, and collected throughout my whole ordeal, my feelings are still very raw, and she waved her right to me the day she let P.A., my personal nickname for her lover, put his, this might come off as heartless, but I don't care about this woman. I haven't cared about her in a very long time. I know that many people will demonize me here, but I don't really care. If you were in my position, you would interpret her actions very differently. Some of you will look up my post history and assume that I was the reason behind her suicide attempt, that I tormented her for months, tricking her into believing I was being unfaithful while she was being unfaithful, and ruining her life in the process, destroying her career and social life in the process. Maybe that's true. Maybe I'm a callous sociopath. But, as Arthur Fleck famously said, you get what you ain't deserve. I gave this woman half of my life and did absolutely everything to be the best possible husband she could ever have. By her own admission, I had no bearing on her decision to step outside of our marriage. She did it for her. Her selfishness knows no bounds, and I'm glad to be rid of her. If it makes me the bad guy, because I will not go see her and never plan on interacting with her ever again, so be it. I hold true to my damn convictions. She made the choice to betray me. She made the choice to put her needs above the needs of our marriage. So now it's my turn to choose me over everything else. She can rot in the darkest pit of hell for all I care. Let everyone else help her fix her. My obligation to ever care about her well-being ended the day we signed the separation agreement. I just needed to get this off my chest. If you're going to cast judgment on me for feeling how I feel, save it. Like I said above, after 23 years and two children, I never really knew this woman after all. I have no sympathy for her, and I never will. Letter F and GR A brief update, according to Sue's father, she inquired, did I come to see her, and she was transferred from the intensive care unit to the mental health wing. Her condition is still being monitored by doctors. Sue is conscious and thinking normally again, but she is clearly tired and he answered no, and she shut down. I've arranged counseling for the 17th, the first visit is this coming Monday. After he politely mentioned any additional news, he'll share only if I question because he understands the headspace I'm in. Update following STBXW's failed attempt at a living, I'm writing this here as therapy, a way to express my thoughts in a practical way. Today, in defiance of everything I've said in my earlier posts and comments, I went to see Sue. She's been discharged from the hospital for four days, and, strangely enough, Nina was the one who persuaded me that I needed to see her because, as she put it, seeing her one last time in her frail state is the only way I'd be able to let go of the contempt I feel for her. Consequently, at approximately 6 p.m., I called her for the first time since I had served her. Her voice was weak and hoarse, and she started crying as soon as she heard my voice. It took her nearly three minutes to gather herself enough to speak again. Before she could say anything more, I informed her that I would be seeing her in an hour, at 8 p.m., and she agreed. My new flat in Co-op City is about an hour and a half away from my old house, so I headed there after getting something to eat at the neighborhood pizzeria. I arrived at the house at 7.47 p.m., and she was there when I pulled into the driveway. As I got closer, I could see the toll her actions had taken on her, she was visibly thinner, the unhealthy kind of thin, she looked like the walking dead overall. When she tried to hug me the first thing she did, I stopped her cold, and she quickly realized that I wasn't there to comfort her. We went inside and sat in the living room, where Sue started talking to me right away. She told me she couldn't live with the guilt of what she did to me and the boys, that she went into a downward spiral of agony and guilt that led her to try suicide. 
Her friend, the one who called me from the hospital, had noticed her behavior and started coming over to check on E. She said she felt she was doing the right thing in her head, but eventually, when she thought I was cheating, it all hit her like a ton of bricks. The feeling of betrayal was suffocating, and she had to get out of it as soon as possible. Of course, by then it was too late. She also apologized for sharing the many intimate details of our marriage and speaking ill of me to him. I know she never imagined herself as the kind of person who could do that, but she did. She then asked me at what point did I stop caring, to which I said the night she confronted me with the notion of me cheating, with the fervor that did, knowing full well she'd been fingos for months at that point. I lost all respect for her, and it steeled my resolve to enact my plan. She told me that when she woke up Christmas morning and found the gift I left, she was over the moon until she opened it. That's when she realized what it was and how much I had known. She literally went mad and hasn't set foot in our bedroom since. She was frantically trying to find if anyone knew where I was. But when she went on FB to ask, she started getting thrashed by friends and family about what she had done but had no idea how everyone knew so fast. That's when I told her about the other binders. The look of shock on her face was priceless. It all dawned on her that I did this to her, everything she's gone through, her friends turning on her, her family shaming her, and yes, even her losing her job was my doing. She just fell silent and shut down after that. When I returned to the living room, she was crying with her face in her hands, and I can honestly say that I felt nothing at all, no more rage, no more anger, and not even the slightest hint of sympathy. They say that the opposite of love is indifference, and that's exactly what I felt when I looked at her. The bathroom was disorganized, the mirror was broken, her skincare products were all over the place, and the tub looked like it hadn't been cleaned since they took her to the hospital. I messed everything up, she replied, raising her gaze to mine. I ruined us and I have no idea what to do I can't do this by myself self I tell her she's got her family or friend who found her and our sons but she doesn't have me she never will ever again I tell her I came to give her closure from the ordeal she just subjected herself to but the moment I walk out that door I'm never looking back. So the topic of PA comes up not long after she tells me he reached out to her two days ago they talked for a couple hours and it ended with her telling him he needs. To move on with his life find a younger woman and forget she exists the remainder of the convo was Sue apologizing for he betraying me and asking again was this really the end I look her dead in the eyes with no hesitation and say yes it's been over long before I served the divorce notice on Christmas I felt it was my cue to depart no words were said because what more could be said I left her sitting on the couch, closed the door behind me got in my car and drove home it's 2.56 am as I'm. Typing this I needed to get this out while it's fresh in my head this is it the saga of Sue is done 17 and I are both scheduled for counseling in the coming weeks nah and I are still going strong and sticking to the plan of keeping things under wraps until my divorce is final I'm staying active and motivated and looking forward to a future with a woman I know well cherish and honor me. Because she's done so from the shadows for decades it's time for me to focus on the life ahead of me so this. Will probably be the last time I post for a while maybe I'll come back with an update when the divorce is official to everyone who has sent me words of encouragement and well wishes thank you to all of those who praised me for my plan of revenge I cap honestly say I wish it never came to it but if I had to go back and do it again I wouldn't change a single thing I did aside from maybe doing more to pee than just getting him fired and to the one guy who harassed me saying I deserved it because I raped my Wife you're effing delusional and get you tag nut hopping my green ass on out of here update where things are where things are going anyway it's been just over two months to the day I served my wife divorce papers and a month since my last update which I said was likely going to be my final one but a lot has gone down since that post and seeing is coming back to this account and seeing hundreds of messages and responses still after my last post. I'll go ahead and let everyone know what's going on. But before all that I sincerely have to say thank you again for all of the support and kindness that's been sent my way over my plight I'm as thankful for all of the love I've gotten on reddit as I the love I've gotten from my family so first I want to start with an aspect a lot of people have been concerned with 17 my youngest son just days after my last post he began I see I went with him his first two sessions and he's gone by himself for everyone once since he goes two times a week and it has. 
drastically helped for the most part he's doing fine but I can say that his trust in relationships has been completely shattered the lasting effects of his own experience with infidelity coupled with Dila's mother's actions of cheating and her attempted suicide has left a pretty big scar that I think may take decades to heal I come to find out his experience was even worse than his let on he actually caught his ex-GF making out with a guy he thought was a friend but it turned out was only Getting buddy-buddy with him to get to her he never told me this aspect of his breakup my heart breaks for my son to have had to experience this at such a pivotal point of his formative years you do all you can to protect your children but then life goes ahead and says no he's decided he's going to stick to IC for the long term and I have told him if ever he needs to, to talk to me about anything nothing is out of bounds next up. There's my IC it's safe to say if you've read the bulk of my entries. I have a bit of an anger problem which is strange because I've always been a reserved controlled and man but this whole experience evidently woke a sleeping dragon in me that's a pure fire breather I've talked about everything with my therapist and when I say everything I mean everything when I explain to him the extent of what I did to my ex he was both impressed and appalled. Not the reaction I was expecting apparently I display sociopathic tendencies when provoked which doesn't surprise me at. All given everything I did my sessions are not so much dramatic they're more so organizational unpacking all of the things going on in my head regarding the implosion of my marriage and trying to find balance now for the elephant in the room now nah, I have no idea where I'd be without this woman never did I ever expect to have such a caring empathetic nurturing woman by my side to carry me through all of this we are still very much going strong and try as we have to keep our ongoing relationship under wraps it's pretty much out of the bag within our group she just gets me she always has since we were teens and since she knows the pain of having the person you've invested your life into being with cheat on you as well she does all she can to help me cope with my feelings we split time between staying at her place and my own the discussion has come up about moving in with each other but her five-year-old puts a kibosh on that idea my place isn't big enough for three people and I'm locked into my lease until 2022 so for now we'll keep splitting time between when her daughter is away with her father Nina's at my place when she has her daughter I'm at her speaking of her daughter I absolutely adore her and she's taken a shining to me I wish I could find the words to truly put into perspective how important Nah has been to me through all of this if you haven't taken the time to read my previous entries Nah has secretly been in love with me since we were sophomore in. Hi school but she was an ugly duckling back then who thought she had no chance with me she actively sat by and watched me chase after date and marry Masan to be ex-wife soon knowing how she felt well over 25 years she held this secret until a week after I had my divorce hearing where we met for food and she laid everything on the table I consider myself lucky to have her in my life we constantly talk about what the future hold between us as we've both been burned by marriage we're definitely not going that route but we have discussed a civil union will probably wait a little while before going that route but it's pretty much decided between the two of us that we are at for each other last but not least the soon to be ex-wife sue what i have to tell everyone about here is that well there's nothing to tell you after the final time i spoke to her after her attempted suicide i tell her that she has her family her friend who found her and our sons but she doesn't have me and she never will again I tell her that I came to give her closure from the ordeal she just put herself through, but as soon as I walk out that door, I'm never coming back. I can't do this on my own. I ruined us. Shortly afterward, the subject of PA comes up. She tells me he messaged her two days ago. They had a couple of hours of conversation, during which she told him he should forget about her and move on with his life. The rest of the conversation consisted of Sue asking again if this was really the end and apologizing for betraying me. I look her in the eyes and say yes, it's over long before I serve the divorce notice on Christmas, I felt it was my cue to leave, no words were exchanged because there was nothing left to say. I left her sitting on the couch, shut the door behind me, got in my car, and drove home. As I type this, it is 2.56 a.m. It's time for me to focus on the life ahead of me, so this will probably be the last time I post for a while. When the divorce is official, maybe I'll come back with an update. Nah and I are still going strong and sticking to the plan of keeping things under wraps until my divorce is final. I'm staying active and motivated, looking forward to a future with a woman I know will cherish and honor me because she's done so from the shadows for decades. Thank you to everyone who has offered support and well wishes. To everyone who has complimented me on my revenge plan, I can honestly say that I wish it never happened, but if I had to go back and do it all over again, I wouldn't change a thing I did, 
well, maybe doing more than just getting P fired, and to the one guy who has harassed me, saying that I deserved it because I raped my wife, you are incredibly delusional. Get your tag nut hopping my green ass on out of here. Update on where I am and where I'm going. Well, it's been a month since my last post, which I said was probably going to be my last one, and just over two months since I served my wife with divorce papers. But a lot has happened since then, and since people are returning to this account and finding hundreds of messages and responses even after my last post, I'll go ahead and let everyone know what's going on. But before all that, I must sincerely thank you once more for all the love and support that has been extended to me during my ordeal. I'm grateful for all the love I've received on Reddit as well as the love I've received from my family. So first, I want to start with an aspect a lot of people have been concerned with, 17, my youngest son. Just days after my last post, he began I see. I went with him his first two sessions, and he's gone by himself for everyone once since. He goes two times a week, and it has drastically helped. For the most part, he's doing fine, but I can say that his trust in relationships has been completely shattered. The lasting effects of his own experience with infidelity, coupled with his mother's actions of cheating and her attempted suicide, have left a pretty big scar that I think may take decades to heal. I come to find out his experience was even worse than he let on. He actually caught his ex-girlfriend making out with a guy he thought was a friend, but it turned out was only getting buddy-buddy with him to get to her. He never told me this aspect of his breakup. My heart breaks for my son to have had to experience this at such a pivotal point of his formative years. You do all you can to protect your children, but then life goes ahead and says no. He's decided he's going to stick to IC for the long term, and I have told him if ever he needs to talk to me about anything, nothing is out of bounds. Next, my IC. If you've read most of my entries, you've probably noticed that I have a bit of an anger management issue. This whole experience has clearly awakened a sleeping dragon in me that is a pure fire breather. I've discussed everything with my therapist, and I mean everything, and he was impressed and appalled when I told him the full extent of what I had done to my ex, which was not the reaction I had anticipated. Given everything I did, it's evident that I exhibit sociopathic tendencies when provoked, which doesn't surprise me in the slightest. Our sessions aren't particularly dramatic, they're more so organizational, unpacking all the thoughts swirling around the collapse of my marriage and attempting to find balance. Now, for the elephant in the room, nah. I have no idea where I'd be without this woman. Never did I ever expect to have such a caring, empathetic, nurturing woman by my side to carry me through all of this. We are still very much going strong, and try as we have to keep our ongoing relationship under wraps, it's pretty much out of the bag within our group. She just gets me, she always has since we were teens. And since she knows the pain of having the person you've invested your life into being with cheat on you as well, she does all she can to help me cope with my feelings. We split time between staying at her place and my own. The discussion has come up about moving in with each other, but her five-year-old puts a kibosh on that idea. My place isn't big enough for three people, and I'm locked into my lease until 2022. So for now, we'll keep splitting time between when her daughter is away with her father, Nina's at my place, and when she has her daughter, I'm at hers. Speaking of her daughter, I absolutely adore her, and she's taken a shining to me. I wish I could find the words to truly put into perspective how important Na has been to me through all of this. If you haven't taken the time to read my previous entries, Na has secretly been in love with me since we were sophomores in high school, but she was an ugly duckling back then who thought she had no chance with me. She actively sat by and watched me chase after, date, and marry Masan, my soon-to-be ex-wife Sue, knowing how she felt. Well, over 25 years, she held this secret until a week after I had my divorce hearing where we met for food, and she laid everything on the table. I consider myself lucky to have her in my life. We constantly talk about what the future holds between us, as we've both been burned by marriage. We're definitely not going that route, but we have discussed a civil union. We'll probably wait a little while before going that route, but it's pretty much decided between the two of us. That we are meant for each other. And last but not least, the soon-to-be ex-wife Sue, about whom I have nothing good to say. After the last time I spoke to her following her suicide attempt. That's about it. 
life moves on for the most part. As of right now, it's March 2nd, which means that there is still one month left for the filing to be processed. By this time next month, I'll be an official free man, and I'm counting down the days until I can finally and truly start the next chapter of my life. I have no idea how or what she's doing, and I don't care to ever know. As far as I'm concerned, she's dead to me. Edit to correct, I misspoke when I said that I was clinically diagnosed as a sociopath. My therapist's observation that I exhibit sociopathic tendencies when provoked was not a clinical diagnosis, but rather his professional opinion. Additionally, my 22-year-old oldest son did not truly intend to hurt P.A., he said what he said out of rage. Update the end and farewell on April 13th, just one month ago, Sue officially became my ex-wife. I was initially told by my lawyer that it would go through on the 18th, but due in part to things here in NYC starting to open up with a lowering of COVID cases, it was pushed through a few days earlier. My lawyer, Jeff gave me a call on April 12th and asked me to come see him the following day. When I did, he handed me the finalization notice and shook my hand. I couldn't just leave it at that, so I went in and gave him a hug and thanked him for all he'd done for me. On my way home, all I could do was just replay mental movies of everything the last 24 years of my life, all of the memories, all of the history. When I stepped into my apartment, it finally happened. I hit the floor, and all the emotion that has been compressed in me came pouring out. I haven't cried like that in ages, but it wasn't a sad cry, not by any means. My soul felt like it had been set free after being held in the deepest, darkest abyss. That night, I called 22. I was brief and sweet, telling him that it's finalized and his mother and I are no longer married. He asked how I was feeling, and I assured him I was fine. Next. I called 17, and we talked for almost 90 minutes. 22 and his fiancée have been taking excellent care of him, and he continues, like myself, to attend therapy. I won't go into specifics about what we discussed, but I will say there's still a lot of work to be done, particularly with regard to 22's perspective on relationships. Later that night, Na came to see me, as she always does, obviously. I broke the news to her, and she just wrapped her arms around my waist and held tight as, yes, I cried again, and when I got my bearings, Nina assured me that she loved me unconditionally and that I could count on her to never betray me, and I know that every word of it was true. I know that I made the wrong choice in choosing her, in the last four and a half months, Na has given me so much and asked for nothing in return, all she asks of me is to be there for her, I don't want to ramble on about her too much, but she is my hero. There's also some other interesting events that came to pass following the divorce finalization. Case in point, POS actually reached out to me. Yes, he actually sent me a message here on Reddit. Turns out he saw the story when it blew up on YouTube and immediately recognized that it was about him. Before anyone asks, no, I will not be revealing what his Reddit username is. I think I've made the kids suffer enough. The first thing he did was apologize for his hand in all of this. He gave me a rundown of what the results of the binder I sent his mother did. Essentially, he's been excommunicated from his family. His mother, as I learned when I was planning out my payback, is a devout Catholic woman be in church three days a week, no me patri spiritu sante type of devout. So her views on marriage are sacred and learning that her son just broke up a marriage that was almost a quarter century long sent her into a rage. She kicked him out that very day, and within the week, when his employer got the binder I sent to them, he was fired as well. He's been couch hopping and trying to find a new job ever since. He claimed he wanted to reach out to me on social media, you know, all of the places he blocked me when he was with Sue. But he admits he was afraid because, in his words, if I was able to find him before, I could find him again. I admit I could have gone all in on destroying this kid, but I didn't. I asked him when was the last time he saw Sue, and he said he hadn't seen her in months. The last time he had talked to her, Sue told him to forget about her and move on with his life, which I recall Sue saying the last time I had spoken to her. So at the very least, she wasn't lying about that. I asked a few more questions, and the kid was surprisingly forthcoming. I guess he was looking for some kind of penance for the chaos he brought upon himself. A lot of what he said mirrored info I gleaned from text documentation. 
I inferred that I didn't really respond much, I just asked, and he answered. The conversation continued for about 20 minutes before he apologized once more, at which point I sent him this screenshot of the conversation. At the age of 27, you must spend the rest of your life realizing that your mother despises you for ending a marriage that lasted nearly as long as you have been alive. Karma is gnawing at you, I know that's why you messaged me, but I won't offer you closure. At the age of 27, I was establishing a legacy. You're a jobless, homeless home wrecker right now. If you're intelligent, you'll take this lesson to heart, if not, you'll be a expletive until you're at least my age. Providing you reach that point. I wish you luck, but you already have luck, you just need to organize your crap. Not the kind of closure he was seeking for, clearly, and I could have been much more nasty, but I believe those comments will haunt him enough as is. With that, I closed the conversation and blocked him. The next major event is that as of May 4, 2021, now is now my encore deaf frog. Over the last two months, we have had long discussions as to where we want things to go between us. Nina made it abundantly clear that she has no intentions of ever being with anyone else but me, and she wants my namesake. She wants to be my wife and wants me to adopt her daughter, we'll call her Anna, as my own. As I've made mention of in the past, I adore this kid, she's six now, birthday was last month, and she idolizes me. I'm the first father figure she's had since her bio dad pretty much cut out on them when she was four. Nina's made a practice of not introducing any man she's been involved with since her divorce into Anna's life unless they had staying power. Needless to say, I have staying power and experience raising children. And speaking of Anna, 17 and she are like two peas in a pod. The big bro slash lil sis dynamic between them is both stunning and adorable. Seventeen has really clung onto Anna, and after having a talk with my therapist about it, he said it's definitely a good sign. Seventeen sees innocence, he wants to protect Anna even though his innocence has been shattered. So, we decided last Monday to go to City Hall and pull the trigger. It took 24 hours to get the marriage license, and the reveal was the most uneventful reveal ever conceived. I made mention as if no one didn't see this coming, and Big Sis said, now placing bets on when the now expecting post goes up. We thought we were keeping our relationship under wraps all these months, but pretty much everyone figured it out already. So, yay, that was kind of hilarious. Some people are going to say it was too soon, and yes, I said in past comment responses that I'm never getting married again, but that was all before the true dynamic between Nina and I manifested. This woman has professed her undying, unconditional love for me. She has laid in my arms and cried, saying how happy she is and how she never in a million years imagined she'd ever have the chance to be with me. She's gone into painstaking detail about how she's felt about me for the past 25 years and how, even while she was married, she lamented the notion that Sue won. And I honestly had no idea how deep that rabbit hole went. She even went as far as saying there were times where she herself had thoughts of having an affair with me that popped into her head but she could never be that kind of person. Even so, through all of the years I've known her, she has given me so much and asked so little in return. Even the woman I married and had two children with has never shown the amount of love to me that Nina has. I'd be a fool not to give her my name. So now she has it, and we're in the early stages of paperwork for me adopting Anna. Finally, there's Sue. I've not spoken to her since the last time I visited our marital home, which is going on four months ago. But mutual friends, the ones that are left, do send me updates from time to time. Through one of those friends, a realtor I know, I learned that she sold the house, and he gave her a job as a clerical assistant in his firm. In doing so, he waived the assisted payments I had to fork over as a result of her unemployment. She now lives in a small apartment close by his office, which he also helped set her up in. She's functioning but a shell of the woman she was. She's barely gained weight and keeps to herself. She comes in, does her work, and doesn't socialize with anyone but him, likely because her socializing with people from work is where this whole thing started. The last update I got on her was at the end of March, where I thanked him for looking out for her but told him I don't need any more updates. She's no longer my problem. I'm almost certain she knows about Na and me, 
as some of those surviving mutual friends have commented about us. 17 is a year away from being a legal adult, and I have no reason to ever speak to her again, and I won't. And that's that. My journey of betrayal, revenge, attempted suicide, and mental agony is over. I'll field questions and perhaps a few comments, but ultimately after this, I'm fading back into the swamp to live with my new frog wife and her little tadpole. Thank you so much to all of the thousands of people who have helped me along the way with advice, well wishes, and praise. I feel humbled and blessed to be able to share my story and support others going through the same thing as me. I love all of my new friends that I've made here on Reddit. I never would have imagined finding such wonderful people in a place where, let's be honest, not so wonderful things can be said. Keep it classy and green, Reddit. Thank you for listening to our story. Please share your thoughts, and if possible, suggest different endings for us. We are always ready to update and bring you more interesting stories. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to get the latest updates. Wishing you a wonderful day.